Hey scientists, we are back. Last week we talked a little bit about what it is to be a scientist, what science is, how it's all around us, and different questions that we can ask, like why, how, where, who, when. All of these questions lead to being a great scientist. Now today, we're gonna continue thinking about what it means to be a scientist. And we're gonna continue thinking about what it means to be a scientist through notebooks. All great scientists have science notebooks, and those science notebooks allow scientists to collect information, like observations, or we call that data, to then use to draw conclusions and learn about the things that they're wanting to study or about the world around them. Today we're going to read a book called Notable Notebooks, T Scientists and Their Writings by Jessica Fries Gaither. Now scientists, as we read through this book, I want you to be thinking about what are some ways that you, as a scientist, could use a science notebook? Is it making sketches of what you see in your neighborhood around you? Is it writing down and analyzing ingredients for a recipe? That's science. Is it trying to figure out exactly what time the sun rises and sun sets every day to make predictions about what's going to happen in a couple weeks? I want you to think about how you, as a scientist, can use notebooks to help you learn about the things around you. Let's get started. Notable Notebooks, Scientists and Their Writing. Of all the scientist tools, objects rare and common, the lowly science notebook is most easily forgotten. Scientists write in notebooks about every plant and crater. Notebooks help them understand what they observe in nature. What makes a notebook special it's a place to think and dream, to write down thoughts and questions about all you have seen. Look at all of this writing this young scientist is doing. We have a labeled diagram of a fish. There's the scientific process. We've got weathering and erosion. So many things. If you find a science notebook, open it and have a look. You'll surely be amazed by what's inside this book. Reading such a notebook is a great way to explore. We can learn so many things from those who came before. Don't believe me? Then let's go. Let's travel through time and see exactly how important one notebook just might be. Let's visit Galileo. Back in 1641, he drew inside his notebooks planets orbiting the sun. In his notebook was a model of thinking that was new. His ideas, though quite correct, were not a welcome view. You can see his notebook right here. It's an actual page. Galileo filled his notebooks viewing the night sky, observing moons and stars and comets as they were passing by. Galileo's evidence helped imaginations roam. Other famous scientists looked at things closer to home. Isaac Newton was a genius. He truly did it all. Complex calculations in his notebook he did scrawl. Legend says he thought, aha, under a shady apple tree. Whatever's true, he did define the theory of gravity. Measurements and data convey the greatest wonders. And Sir Isaac Newton's notebooks contained lots and lots of numbers. Math's a part of science, no matter what you do. But other things like drawing can help you learn too. There's a page out of Isaac Newton's notebook. Beatrix Potter was an author. She loved to write and draw, but she also was a scientist who recorded what she saw. Insects, rocks, and fungi all graced her notebook pages. The detail in her drawing is a treasure for the ages. Miss Potter used her talents to answer her own query or question. Sketching helps her understand the fungi's life quite clearly. Notebooks can be valuable to organize and review. They also are essential when describing something new. On the rooftop of a bank, Maria Mitchell could see, peering through her telescope as part of her routine. On a clear October night, Something caught her eye. Could it be a bright new comet she saw zooming by? Indeed, it was, as she had thought, a great discovery. 
Miss Mitchell, with her careful notes, helped all the world to see. Notebooks aren't just for notes. There's more that you can do. Scientists plan experiments and then conduct them too. Did you know that insects hear? Surprising, but it's true. Before Charles Henry Turner, it was something no one knew. Dr. Turner studied ants and bees and all the ways they act. His experiments uncovered things we know except as facts. Cockroaches we know can learn. Bees see color, patterns too. Without Dr. Turner's notes, we'd think that insects just flew. A notebook is a place to plan experiments or tests and also see patterns in the data that could suggest. High atop a craggy peak with a notebook and a pen, Dr. Lonnie Thompson surveyed Peru once again. He studied where a glacier lay, then looked back in his book. A single glance at early notes was all that it then took. This glacier is retreating, there's no doubt about that. The world has gotten warmer since the last time here I sat. Scientists craft explanations. They find the missing link. Good thing that in a notebook, one can reflect and think. In a forest in Gombe, Jane Goodall sat quite still. The chimpanzees were very close their nearness, such a thrill. She observed for many years, described their lives and play. Her notes on their behavior are important still today. Many a page of journal writing helped her understand our relatives, the chimpanzees, and thus her fellow man. Dr. Goodall took her notes in a remote and wild place. Our next scientist's notebooks have been to outer space. Ellen Ochoa is an astronaut and a brilliant engineer. On four short missions out to space, she explored a vast frontier. Dr. Ochoa used her notebooks to describe her NASA missions. Another set of notebooks fulfilled her other great ambitions. Notebooks hold the story of her various designs. She used many, many pages to think, create, and refine. Inventors also use notebooks to plan, design, and dream. Sometimes the results they get are not quite what they seem. The chemist Stephanie Kwalek, her job was to invent. She is now remembered for a happy accident. At her first, best discovery seemed like a big mistake. Little did she know she'd found a substance tough to break. Her notebooks outlined all the steps for inventing this strong strand. A fiber called Kevlar could save lives across the land. Making sense of data can be difficult to do, but if you keep on trying, then you might find something new. Charles Darwin wrote in his while sailing on a boat, and you'd need to use a mirror to read what da Vinci wrote. Marie Curie's findings helped discover the x-ray. Did you know her notebook is radioactive still today? Their studies may be different, both in subject and in style, but the modest science notebook has been essential all the while. Gregor Mendel, Albert Einstein, Rachel Carson too. They all relied on their notebooks. Now what about you? Scientists, you can make a science notebook at home on your own. All you need is a notebook, spiraled or composition, doesn't matter. It can be lined or unlined, doesn't matter. And the second thing you need to do is come up with a question. What is something you're curious about? Something you want to learn? Once you have your question, now you can write your question in your science notebook. Then you can start making observations or doing safe experiments at home to answer your scientific question. As you make observations or as you do safe experiments at home, make sure you write down what you're observing. What do you see? What's happening? Why could that be? Ask more questions. 
If you come across an observation that you find confusing or you're not sure about, ask more questions. Why? Where? When? Who? How? That's what a great scientist does. So scientists, in your notebook, keep those observations, those drawings, those writings, labeled pictures. And once you've gone through and you've tested or made all of your observations, then you can go back and look at all of your observations and notes or data. When you look at all of your data, you'll be able to come across what's called a conclusion, or that is the answer to your scientific question. Want to know why grass dies without water? That sounds like a great scientific question to observe. See if you can go outside with your science notebook and find out the answer to that question. Scientists, thanks for watching. I hope you get a chance to make your own science notebook and explore, explore all the possibilities of science. Have a great day. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit enrollkc.org today. Hey scientists, welcome back. I'm Jessica Power, one of the science curriculum coordinators at Kansas City Public Schools. Last week we read a book called A to Twist Scientist, and we learned all about this curious young scientist named Ada. And scientists, if you remember, at the very end of the book, Ada had written all of her information and observations all over the wall in the hallway. And her parents were like, I don't know what we're gonna do. Well, her parents came up with a great solution. If you remember in the book, her parents had created that paper roll that was really, really long from the ceiling to the floor, and Ada was able to stand on a ladder and cover the whole paper with her observations and her data. Well, today, scientists, we are focused on data. Now, being a good scientist means that we have to be able to collect, analyze, interpret, and make connections of data. Data can be observations, measurements, it could be simple tallies for trials. It can be comprised of lots of different things. So we're going to use another book this week, scientists, to help us out with data. We're going to read a book called Exemplar Evidence, Scientists and Their Data by Jessica Fries Gaither. Now in this book, you're going to be introduced to many scientists throughout the Earth's history. And in fact, each and every scientist used data in order to help them draw conclusions or make new discoveries that we now know today and still hold to be true. So let's get to it. As you listen today, scientists, I want you thinking about how can you, as a scientist this year, use data to help you learn and make sense of the world around you in science. Here we go. Scientists ponder, question, and wonder about all kinds of subjects from flowers to thunder. But no matter what the quarry is about, a scientist's job is to figure it out. How do scientists find out what is true? They need to have data and lots of it too. Data can be tallies, measurements, numbers, or notes and sketches of amazing wonders. So data doesn't have to be just numbers. It can be drawings and sketches and labeled pictures. You can gather data through experimentation, a process that can lead to much calculation. So measurements must be precisely taken. When it comes to data, you can't be mistaken. How far did that travel? How fast did that go? Answering these questions gives data, you know. Timers and rulers, balances and more, data is collected with tools galore. Afterward, there's just one thing to do. Analyze the data to find something new. By comparing graphing, looking for trends, what will it tell? Well, that depends. 
No matter the data, there's just one aim. Gather enough to make a strong claim. Data is evidence for what's thought to be true. It is the foundation of what scientists do. The importance of data is shown rather well by work of scientists too many to tell. Throughout all of history, data's been key in the making of every great discovery. Alhazen lived in Egypt a thousand years ago, yet still is important for what he did show. A groundbreaking study not hard to understand, investigations need not always be grand. In a darkened room, two lanterns shone light, each one of them hung from a different height. On a far wall, two bright spots could be seen, each one of them formed by the lantern's strong beam. If he covered a lantern, the spot became dark. This simple finding ignited a spark. Light did not come from our eyes, as believed. Instead, it came from the source, he perceived. Alhazen went on to complex topics and even wrote seven books about optics. He remembered all as his methods was clear. He was the first to use data to support his idea. The power to show that an idea is untrue it's amazing what collecting data can do. Marie Marion's data took another form. In fact, her life and work fell outside the norm. During her life, she painted insects of all kinds, traveling far away to see what she could find. Not much was known about insects or how they grew. Where did they come from? The answer, no one knew. Some popular ideas included mud, air, and rain. Exactly how this happened, no one could explain. Marion kept caterpillars, she watched them grow and change, even though to others her studies seemed quite strange. Through her colorful paintings, she could document stages of a life cycle and what those changes meant. Marion's work was remarkably complete. To show such detail was really quite a feat. This precision helped others see the lives of insects from butterflies to bees, the power to develop a new point of view. It's amazing what recording data can do. In the 1800s, new elements were found. These discoveries seemed to be all around. Chemist Dmitri Mendeleev had a gut feeling that organizing their data would be quite revealing. Upon cards, he wrote each one's information, then tried his hand at organization. After many hours, he fell asleep at his desk, but when he awoke, he knew what to do next. He arranged the elements by order, by, high, by weight, and knew he was on to something quite great. Chemistry was changed by his development, Mendeleev's periodic table of elements. The table wasn't just a success on its own. It predicted elements before they were known. It also pointed out some errors in weight. Unfortunately, the records couldn't help be set straight. The power to predict something entirely new, it's amazing what organizing data can do. In Havana, Cuba, the situation was dire. Deadly yellow fever was spreading like fire. Outbreaks occurred time and again, if only doctors could predict where and when. Carlos Juan Finlay was up to the task. As a family doctor, he just had to ask. His patient's histories provided him clues. The data was easy to collect and to use. He looked for patterns, and with some good reason, most outbreaks occurred in the same season. From his data, he inferred the link. Mosquitoes spread the disease in a blink. Sadly, his ideas weren't accepted for years. The mosquito hypothesis fell on death ears. Finlay persisted until others agreed that mosquito prevention was definitely need. The power to stop diseases and prevent them too. It's amazing what comparing data can do. Nettie Stevens studied mealworms in great detail to find out what made them male and female. 
By using a microscope to observe DNA, she had collected data that we still use today. Peering through her microscope, Dr. Steven saw two different chromosomes, one short, the other tall. Male mealworms consisted of one of each kind. Females had two tall ones, a finding surprise. It was the chromosomes, Dr. Stevens did declare. The sex of the larva was determined by the pair. Two of the same meant girl mealworms would be seen. One of each, boy mealworms, determined by their genes. This work was the first to link chromosomes to traits. Her clear observations would set the book straight. All along, data hidden from the naked eye showed females were XX and males were XY. The power to understand what's out of view is amazing what sharing data can do. Dr. Ruby Heros, a chemist who had a brilliant mind, her data was quite different kind. She conducted experiments on blood and cells, collecting data to keep as well. She suffered from an allergy known as hay fever and studied ways to improve a reliever. Adding a new substance to make it work well was a discovery of which others would tell. She contributed to other studies too. A vaccine was the goal for the work that she'd do. To prevent a disease called infantile paralysis, her data would need some careful analysis. Dr. Hero's work did not go unseen, such important studies being anything but routine. At a meeting of chemists of great acclaim, she was one of 10 females mentioned by name. The power to improve lives through and through, it's amazing what interpreting data can do. Down deep in the ocean at the bottom of the sea, Marie Tharp wondered what there might be. A few scientists care about that, for they assumed it was boring and flat. No one could travel there, she had to concede. So how could they get the data they needed? Sonar was used a great innovation to measure the depth of underwater locations. She couldn't go to sea, she stayed on dry land, plotting out thousands of soundings by hand. Tedious work, but she and her partner pressed on, consulting the data for what should be drawn. Mountain ranges and valleys began to take shape. It was an entire underwater landscape. The map she created of the whole ocean floor used to prove others' theories and more. The power to change our current worldview is amazing what visualizing data can do. You can see her mapped out ocean floor, how it changes, or a little mountain here under the ocean. Our human bodies are quite complex. Their intricate workings can often perplex. Dr. Marie Daly advanced our understanding. Her work and findings were truly outstanding. At first she studied the process of digestion and then moved on to a more pressing question. What caused heart attacks, she wanted to know. The answer she hoped her data would show. Dr. Daly analyzed data from many a patient and finally came up with an explanation. Many with high cholesterol had suffered an attack. Their arteries, it seemed, were clogged with plaque. This wasn't the only conclusion she would draw. The effects of cigarettes, something else she saw. By connecting smoking with lung disease, Dr. Daly saved lives thanks to her expertise. The power to build knowledge and improve health too. It's amazing what analyzing data can do. In places where coal, silver, and oil are found, these precious resources are under the ground. How do you know this when you can't see? By using data to predict where they'll be. A geologist in Montana can make such a claim. Dr. Russell Stansover Bull is his full name. Born and raised a proud member of the Crow Nation, his expertise lies in mapping resource locations. Finding these deposits was joy without measure. To, to him, it was hunting for deep buried treasure. Without the right data, it'd be difficult to know exactly where a well or mine needed to go. 
He wanted to do more to help his hometown, so he founded a company in that small town. Its purpose to help other tribes understand how to develop resources on their own land. The power to find resources and help others too. It's amazing what mapping data will do. Scientists use methods to explore, doing their work on land, sea, and shore. Despite all their efforts at the end of the day, without the right data, there is not much to say. Jon Snow used data to stop a deadly disease, and Gregor Mendel got lots of data from peas. Data helped Vera Rubin make a strong case for the existence of dark matter throughout space. Data supports conclusions. It changes people's minds but it's used to build theories that help humankind. Scientists all along have known this to be true. Data is powerful. Now what will you do? Scientists, that last page mentioned that data supports conclusions. You know how when you're writing a paragraph, you have your opening sentence, and then you have details in, within that paragraph? Well, scientists, data Data is the details. When we make observations or make measurements or record how many times something happens or write down what happens during something, the cause and effect, that's data. That tells us as scientists what's happening. Now we get to take that data and analyze it. That means we want to go through it very carefully. We want to find patterns. We want to find connections. We want to interpret that data and make sense of it. We want to understand what is happening throughout our observations. Now, usually a scientist starts with a scientific question. Like, why does the sun rise and set at different times during the course of the year? Or why is there more daylight during the summer and spring than there is in the fall and winter? Scientists, these are great questions that we can use data to find answers for. For example, if you wanted to find out why there's more daylight during the spring and summer than there is in the fall and winter, you could every day record the sunrise and sunset times along with how many hours of daylight we have on Earth each day. Now, after you've gone through that data and collected that data for a certain period of time, I don't know, two months, three months, a year, you can then start to see patterns and you'll start to make sense of things. And then maybe that'll interest you into finding out why seasons occur. Why do we have seasons? And what are the connections between seasons and sunrise and sunset times? I'm getting ahead of myself, scientists. This isn't my science project. This can be your science project. So this year, scientists, as you're learning about different topics in science, have a science notebook. Record your questions, and with the questions you have, take an opportunity to make observations. Collect data, make measurements, tally different things, use numbers. See what conclusions you can find in the data that you collect. Thanks for hanging out with us, scientists. It was great to see you. I'll see you next week. Have a good day. I love Southeast because of the culture, the bank program, and restorative justice. I love Southeast because of the academics, sports, and students. I love Southeast because of the people, the energy, and the advanced classes. It's not a like. I love Southeast because the students here at Southeast are full of potential and they believe in achieving anything. We are, we are Southeast. Southeast. We say shoulder to shoulder. Join the Southeast family. Enroll today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Dr. Jones again talking to my middle school students. And today we're going to pick up the conversation that we had before about rocks and the rock cycle. Now, if you recall, we're talking about how we can use rocks and rock strata to look at the geologic scale or, or geologic time of the Earth. So again, remember, 
when we're looking at rocks, rocks are actually a mixture of chemicals. And from last time I told you, think of the rock as being the actual meal, like breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Think of the minerals as being the parts of the meal, like eggs, bacon, hash browns, okay? Now, when we talk about rocks, remember, there are three main categories of rocks. We have sedimentary rock, we have metamorphic rock, and we have igneous rock. Now, as I said, today we're going to be going over specific characteristics of each of these rocks, how they're being used inside of construction or our everyday lives, and more important, how to use where certain things appear in a rock strata to determine geologic time, what came first and what came afterwards. So, let's start with sedimentary rock. Now, again, remember, sedimentary rock are rocks that accumulate from sediment. It's in the name. Now, there are three main types of sedimentary rock. We have plastic sedimentary rock. This is like sandstone, okay? We have chemical sedimentary rock, like dolomite. And then we have organic sedimentary rock. This would be like our limestone. So let's first start with the plastic, okay? Our clastic sedimentary rock is our sandstone. And so if we're looking, this would be an example of sandstone, okay? Now, with sandstone, understand that, first of all, it's very porous, and it allows water to penetrate very easily. So, we're gonna be using gloves, safety first. If you were to put water on sandstone, and I do not recommend doing this at home, you will find that the water literally penetrates the rock. So here we go, a couple of drops, nothing major. If you're looking at this, instead of the water running down, you see that in a lot of ways, it's just soaked up by the rock, okay? Now, the thing that makes sandstone so fragile is the way that it's made. See, you have to understand that sandstone really comes from erosion or caused by erosion. So when you get additional erosion, you'll just wear more of that rock away. That's one reason why if you look at any of the geologic sites for uh, Egyptian findings and they find sandstone, a lot of times they can't read it. And it's really because the stone itself is not a very strong stone. But because you can chisel into it, it makes very good material for writing, which is one reason why sandstone was used by many cultures as a way of preserving a language. Now, let's talk about the next one. Dolomite. Now remember, we don't want to get dolomite confused with dolomite. All right. So with dolomite this is a more uh durable rock okay it's slightly porous so what you're saying is or what i'm saying is that water won't penetrate through it very easily so again and i'll show you with an example this is an example of our dolomite okay mm. So, when we're looking at our dolomite, you know you get a nice shine, nice sheen on it, okay? So, with dolomite, you will find that if you put water on dolomite, it will just run right off. See? It's not really penetrating. It's running off. Now, the thing about dolomite, though, is that what you find with dolomite is that it is reactive. And it is reactive with acids, okay? So... Here's an acid, add a little bit of this to our dolomite, we make it a little bit of reaction. And if you are looking at this, you'll find that with acid, it literally is penetrating the rock. It's not as exciting as if I use hydrochloric acid, but 
actually love my eyes and at this point would want to take them out. All right. Now, what you do find is that because dolomite is not porous to water, it's very readily available, you will see dolomite as being part of concrete and asphalt. Okay. The last one, limestone. Limestone. Now, what you find about limestone is it's also a very dense rock with very few pore spaces. But limestone, kind of like dolomite, has another property. It reacts with acid. You can actually use limestone to neutralize an acid. Okay? So if you notice, what I actually just did is I put the limestone in where I had some of that pulling of acid from the hydrochloric. And what it's going to do is literally start reacting with it. Again, it's hard to see on camera, but you are getting very small bubbles. And that is when an acid reacts with a base. Here's why. Inside the limestone, you have a material, calcium carbonate, which acts as a base. We find this like in baking soda. So you'll find that Sometimes you can crush up your uh, limestone and apply it to soil to bring down the pH, to make it less acidic, okay? So these are our sedimentary rocks. Now, moving on, let's talk about our igneous rock. Now there are two main types of igneous rock. The first one is plutonic, okay? The other one is volcanic, yes. Wonderful thing about science, you get great words, all right? So let's talk about plutonic first, okay? When we say plutonic, don't get it confused with platonic. If somebody says that you're platonic, that means y'all just friends, nothing else. Plutonic means that, first of all, you get very, very hot, like magma, but you cool and form something that's very strong and very solid, like granite. The other type, which is your volcanic, is like obsidian. And we'll talk about the properties of obsidian versus the properties of granite, okay? So first things first, let me move this out of the way. All right, now, when looking at our plutonic rock, all right? namely our granite. What you'll find is that, first of all, granite is very hard. It resists abrasion, okay? It can bear a lot of weight, which is one reason why you have like granite countertops. It's used for uh, structural material. It resists weathering. If something is made out of granite, it will last a pretty long time. But the nice thing about granite is, if you look at this and you already see some of the shine, you can polish this. So again, it resists abrasion, meaning that it won't just break away like sandstone. But if you do use a uh, sand or something of that nature, you can polish this to a shine, which is one reason why they make very good countertops. Now, if you notice, this is obsidian. Obsidian also has a very nice shine. But here's the thing about obsidian. The way that it's made is it cools very, very quickly. So it gives it a glass-like appearance. What you may not know is that obsidian can produce an edge that is sharper than steel. So what we're saying is that this rock can actually cut better than steel. And you will find that in certain surgical tools, they actually use obsidian in the blade. Now, for those of you who are D&D uh, &D players, Dungeons and Dragons, or Game of Thrones fans, obsidian is the same thing as dragon glass. And so, if in the gaming world you find an obsidian blade, pick it up. It's very valuable. Lastly, let's talk about metamorphic rock. Remember, metamorphosis? All right, so... With our metamorphic rock, we have two types, foliated and non-foliated, okay? Foliated doesn't mean that you fold. However, it does mean that you have layers or bands. 
So for those of you who um, walk around with a lot of cash, uh, you could have your money foliated with a rubber band. So when you're talking about non-foliated, we're talking about rocks that don't have these layers. So the two that we're really going to look at is pink marble and slate. Now, what's the difference between pink marble and slate? Well, first of all, let's talk about our pink marble, okay? With pink marble, you find that, again, you don't get the banding. You don't get these areas, like with slate, where you have light and dark. With slate, unlike marble, you don't have a continuously smooth surface, okay? So, let's talk about this. Slate marble okay with our slate and we'll start with slate slate is a rock that again is mainly made of clay now what you'll find is that it can be cut into sheets and it resists moisture like water and weathering which is one reason why you'll find sometimes that slate is very good as a building material like in slate roofs but slate's not cheap so unless you just like throwing money away it's far better to use the asphalt roof with the limestone in it from before. Now, the nice thing about slate is it also reduces freezing. So that temperature difference is one reason why slate is sometimes used. Now, slate makes very good countertop materials for this very same reason. Basically, hot won't make it hot, cold won't make it cold. Okay? Now, slate is not pretty. Okay, so now we talk about our marble. When we look at marble, especially like pink marble, one of the things that you'll find is with pink marble, pink marble has a very nice shine. Meaning, if I sand this down, I can make it shine like a countertop. You find that marble in itself can be carved into shapes, which is one reason why, at times, it's used not only for structures, but for ornamentation and ornamental objects. You also find that it will, just like granite, come in contact with acid and it will neutralize it. So, again, think about the fact that metamorphic rock is made from either sedimentary rock or igneous rock. So, some of the same properties that they have, metamorphic rock will have too. So, the question may be, all right, why is this so important, Dr. Jones? We've gone through all these rocks. You put acid on some, you uh, put water on others. What does this have to do with me, the map, or the EOC? Here's what it has to do. When you look at rock layers, you can understand or make a determination about what occurred in the past. So, here's an example. A scientist is looking at this particular cliff and what you'll find is that he or she saw that at layers three and five three and five there was cooling of lava now we know if you have cool lava what kind of rock do you have igneous exactly and you would not expect organisms to live in igneous rock so one of the things that you can see is the rock progresses bop, 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 bop. it builds so if asked the question, what's the oldest layer? If it builds, the oldest layer in the cliff would be at the bottom. We also can know this because if we look at these two organisms, these organisms, which one is a, a ammonite and the other one is a trilobite, are older than these, which would be mammals, uh, birds, and plants. Look at this one. Explain how the location changed over time. Again, if you look at the rocks, here's what you'll notice. Here, you actually have some aquatic species. But notice here, you don't. Again, I would think that this would probably be, be sedimentary rock. Then there was some volcanic activity. And then the organisms that came back were no longer aquatic because now it's dry. Okay? And so my answer would be based on the organisms and based on where it is, that's how I can see how it changed over time. 
And then this last question. It talks about, can you make a claim about what happened to the dinosaurs as it relates to volcanic activity? You know what it says? Science claims that volcanic eruptions, blowing up, caused dinosaurs to become extinct. Describe whether you agree or disagree with the scientific claim. Well, let's look at this. Here is a dinosaur track. Here is a volcanic um, layer, right? Here's another dinosaur track. So do you think that the dinosaurs died out because of this volcano? If they did, they wouldn't be here. So again, you would use a rock or rock layers to give you a story about a time on the earth when we weren't present. So, with all that being said, I just want you to remember, one, there are three types of rocks, sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic. Two, the oldest rock layers are at the bottom. And three, depending on the organisms in the layers, you could get an idea of what happened, which organisms went extinct, and which organisms were able to survive the catastrophe, okay? Have a great day, and I'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Dr. Jones again. This time I'm talking to my high school students. And we're picking up the conversation that we had last week when I was talking about heredity and genetics. Now, remember, when we're talking about heredity and genetics, we're really talking about the difference between our asexual and sexual reproductions and how that process will change the offspring and cause variations in a particular species. Now, again, from last week, if you recall, there are three main types of asexual reproduction. And again, when we're talking about asexual reproduction, we're talking about without egg and sperm interaction. The first one is binary fission, as I said last week. That's what we're talking about when we think about bacteria. The next is budding. That's what we would find with the hydra. Again, not the mythical beast, but the actual aquatic uh, microorganism or single cell organism and then you have your uh, flagella I'm sorry <laughs> then you have your fragmentation your fragmentation you'll find in your uh, starfish and your sea stars okay now I also said asexual reproduction can actually occur in organisms that do carry on uh, sexual reproduction but only in certain cells remember we said in body cells or somatic cells we have this process called mitosis where what we're going to be doing is making a copy of darter cells from a mother cell. This week, we're going to talk about the flip side. We're going to be talking about sexual reproduction. And in sexual reproduction, again, we're talking about making another organism as a result of egg and sperm interacting. So, amphibians, mammals, human beings, all of us go through a process of sexual reproduction to get about offspring. So again, remember, asexual, somatic cells, mitosis, but meiosis, which is the sexual reproduction, will allow you to get an offspring from a mother and a father. <laughs> now, let's talk about what, what are the benefits of both, because there are some pros and cons, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you're looking at sexual reproduction, first of all, sexual reproduction allows for high genetic variability. Here's what that means. You don't want every single plant to look the same. Here's why. If there's a disease that affects a certain plant and all the plants are the same, all the plants would die from the disease. Same thing with human beings. You wouldn't want a disease to come along where every human being is genetically susceptible to that disease because then the entire species dies. So that's one reason that sexual reproduction is 
the more uh, desired approach for getting offspring when you have a higher ordered life. Bacteria make millions and billions of copies of themselves and they go through mutations a lot faster than human beings. So with bacteria, if you have a million bacteria of a billion colony of bacteria, then that million dies, you know, no harm, no foul. Yeah, I'm saying this as a human being, not the bacteria who's, you know. Now, one thing about it is it does facilitate adaptation, meaning if the environment changes because of the variation, parts of the species will change and part of the species can survive that change. And it also, like it says, speeds up evolution. So what you find is that you'll get all of these different variations in a matter of generations as opposed to having variations that occur longer on longer periods of time. But we're talking minor ones. We're not talking about like human beings having wings, but we're talking about like having two individuals that have like hazel eyes have a child that has blue eyes. Okay. Now, when you look at some of the advantages of asexual reproduction, first of all, it saves energy. You do not have to expend as much energy if you're just making copies. It's, it's literally like a copy machine. As opposed to actually writing a unique or an original document. Next, you find that uh, courtship is not an issue. I don't need a mate because I can just make a copy of myself. I'm going to just leave that right there. And then finally, you have the greatest ability to increase the fitness for each individual. So what we're talking about with the fitness is if one organism can survive an environment and it makes a copy of itself, then that other organism can survive an environment. But with sexual reproduction, there are times when you could have two healthy individuals and they produce an offspring that has an anomaly or has a disease. Okay? So, disadvantages. Well, first of all, sexual reproduction, it costs. You gotta pay to play. Everybody knows that. Any guy out here who has a girlfriend knows. As soon as you get a girlfriend, you go broke. Quick. Yep, dating ain't cheap. Next, courtship takes time and takes resources. Again, I'm just saying, love don't go free. Don't care what anybody tells you, love ain't free. And then the last one is, there's usually a sacrifice of fitness for one um, species to another. So what you find is that, like I said, there are times when you could have two healthy individuals that will produce an offspring that because of the variation in genetics, could be susceptible to something that the two parents are not susceptible to. Case in point, I'm not allergic to nuts. My wife's not allergic to nuts. I have two kids that are allergic to nuts. Go figure. Now, asexual reproduction, some of the downsides. First of all, low genetic variability. Like I said, if you have a disease that affects or targets a genetic disposition, meaning genetic makeup, everybody with that makeup will die. Well, if every plant or every bacteria or every whatever has the exact same genetic makeup, then all those organisms become susceptible and die. All right, next one. Adaptation to environment is difficult. Well, here's why. If you have an organism who is specific for a certain environment, and you drastically change it, then what you actually are doing is causing that organism and all the organisms that came from it to not be able to survive. Okay? That's one reason why, like, at times bacteria can be easily killed by changing their environment. You can make it either too hot or make it too cold. Okay? And then um, it retards evolution. Retard actually means to slow down or to stop. Okay? Or to hamper. That's what the word actually means. And so when you're talking about making copies after copy after copy, you're going to slow down that process. Now, you may think, well, why would you want to slow down evolution? Well, think about it like this. I have skin on my hand. I would not want a cut to occur and all of a sudden 
I have some kind of new patch of skin in the mess of all of this. Or I wouldn't want like half my eye to be brown and then the other half of my eye to be blue because um, then you get all kinds of light sensitivity issues. Okay? And yes, folks who have lighter color eyes sometimes tend to have issues with bright light. Okay? So, let's talk about the process of meiosis. As I said, meiosis is a process in which, one, you have one cell actually becoming four, but the main thing is that you're taking the genetic information in this one cell and you're breaking it up, you're dividing it. You're taking a deck of cards and saying, okay, although I have 52 cards here, I'm going to deal you out 13, you out 13, you out 13, you out 13. All right, everybody has 13, okay? Now, there's two processes that occur in meiosis, whereas mitosis is one. But the idea is, as we go from here, which is the, the parent cell with everything in it, to here, the darter cells, not only do you decrease the amount of genetic information, but you also alter it such that you don't get an identical copy of what you started out with. Now, let's talk about that this process of creating new chromosomes, all right? Imagine this. Imagine I had a deck of cards that are red, deck of cards that are blue. I take the deck of red, deck of blue, shuffle them together, and then deal out cards. Some people get more red, some people get more blue, some people get the exact same amount. Same thing. With meiosis, you start out with your parental chromosome. Basically, exactly what you got from your mom and dad. You can go down two paths. One, in which you don't cross over, which means you will get either one of your dad's chromosomes or one of your mom's chromosomes, or you can have crossing over occurring and then you get a blend. You could have one of your dad's chromosomes. You could have one of your mom's chromosomes. You could have one of your mom's chromosomes with some of your dad's chromosomes or some of your dad's chromosome with some of your mom's chromosome. So what you find is that's where the variation comes into play. So ladies and gentlemen, as I said, when you're looking at your genetic traits, first of all, you get some from your mom, you get some from your dad. And depending on if they're monogenetic, it'll be on and off, or polygenetic where it's like a dimmer and you can get anything from light, 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 light to very, very dark. I hope this helps you guys and I'll see you next time.